We got. I got the invitation to go on this armed Lutheran radio show, though. You know this guy? Have you seen this? I got. There's two things that I would like to say that make me feel safe. Number one, the fact that there is a radio show called the Armed Lutheran Podcast somewhere in the world that makes me feel safe. Pistols, prayer, and potluck. This is Armed Lutheran Radio. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of Armed Lutheran Radio, a show about guns, hunting, competitive shooting, the natural right of self-defense, and what God's Word says about the issues surrounding gun rights and gun ownership. I'm your host, Lloyd Bailey, the Armed Lutheran, and this is episode number 420. Thank you all so much for making Armed Lutheran Radio a part of your week again this week, and thank you to all of you who are new and just joining us for the first time. Hope you enjoy the show, and we'll come back and check out um, more Armed Lutheran goodness in the future. Um, today we have, uh, I, I just wanted to comment on a news story that I saw that caught my eye this week. I had several of these that I had set aside. I think I will only address one today. But first, I want to give a big shout out to the men and women who make this show possible, the members of the Reformation Gun Club. And today's shout out goes out to Melvin from Holt, Missouri, the disreputable Bartlett, Paul from McKinney, Texas, Jerry and Billy from Deer Lodge, Montana, Donnie from White Bear Lake, Minnesota, Dan from South Lyon, Michigan, Mark from Lake Havasu City, Arizona, Frank from Lake City, Michigan, Stuart from Pensacola, Florida, and Paul from Sheridan, Wyoming. Thank you all so much for your support. And uh, thank you to all of the members of the Reformation Gun Club. Folks, we are listener-funded. We have no advertising. We have no sponsors. Uh, We rely on the members of the Reformation Gun Club and their annual contributions to help keep things going. We are now partnering with uh, Give, Send, Go to handle all of the uh, contributions from our members. So if you would like to find out more about the benefits of um, becoming a gun club member, all the hundreds of hours of exclusive content, the um, uh, invitations to our online hangouts that we have every month, um, and the next of those will be probably here in a couple of weeks. A couple of the members whom you You heard me uh, shout out to earlier um, our regulars on our um, on our online hangouts. Those would include uh, Donnie from White Bear Lake and um, and Stuart from Pensacola, Florida. They are regular uh, visitors with us, and we would love to have you come and join us for um, uh, for our next online hangout. Check out ReformationGunClub.com or armedlutheran.us slash gun club, and come sign up. We would love to see you at our next get-together. All right, so uh, like I said earlier, I wanted to comment on some gun-related stories that crossed my my path this week and um, share some of my thoughts. I have several of these that I'd set aside. One is kind of funny. Out of Massachusetts, I'll probably do a, a special midweek exclusive for for gun club members on that one. Cause it's just, it's too, too funny. Um, but, um, this one is the one I wanted to, to hit on because it's, it speaks to the discussion about guns and gun control that has been going on recently. And it's encapsulated in this one debate in the, for the, uh, New York 18th congressional district um, that happened on Wednesday last. And, um, this was between candidates, Republican candidate, Allison Esposito and Democrat Congressman, uh, Pat Ryan. Um, and this is from, uh, uh, PIX 11, which I assume is a, a, uh, television station. I assume they, they're the ones that carried this, um, uh, debate. And it's re, uh, republished by News Nation. 
And the headline is Republican NY18 candidate Allison Esposito says America doesn't have a gun problem. Um, and they took, they created that headline to create the impression for those who don't know a whole lot about guns. And that would, I would assume, include a large percentage of folks in New York um, who think guns are just a bad thing and that we do have a gun problem. And the idea in this headline is to try to make Alison Esposito seem out of touch. But if you listen to what she said, it makes perfect sense. Allison Esposito, a Republican candidate running for Congress in New York's 18th district, says she does not support a ban on assault weapons and that America doesn't have a gun problem. Esposito made the comments during a debate against Democratic U.S. Representative Pat Ryan on PIX11 Wednesday night. Uh, so I was right about that. When, when asked if assault weapons should be banned, Esposito said, quote, no, You do not accomplish any rule or safety by taking guns out of legal, lawful people's hands. We have to punish criminals for their actions. She added, quote, we have a heart problem in this country and a mental health problem in this country. We don't have a gun problem in this country, end quote. And additionally, she said she does not support a ban on bump stocks and extended magazines. So, all this is trying to paint Alison Esposito as some kind of extremist, as some kind of nut. Um, she says, we're targeting a weapon and not the individual. We need to be targeting the individual that perpetrates these crimes and hold them accountable. We do not remove a Second Amendment right from our citizens simply because someone else committed a crime. Absolutely freaking right. She is clearly right on these points. The Second Amendment is apparently the only um, right specified or, or codified in the in the Constitution in the Bill of Rights that can be taken away from you because someone else misused it. Now we're starting to see the First Amendment being infringed this way more and more, but from I'd say the '60s forward maybe even go back further than that. Some would go back to the original, you know, the NFA in the 1930s, that the Second Amendment is really the only constitutionally guaranteed right that the government seems to think can be infringed upon because someone else um, abused their rights. Not because you did, because somebody else did, but because a criminal committed a crime with a gun, your rights should be abridged. Uh, Esposito is a retired NYPD deputy inspector and a precinct commander. So she knows that guns don't commit the crimes. She's actually worked to fight crime in New York. So she knows the problem is the criminals. And the problem of violence across the country, not just in, in New York, is not solved by restricting or banning a tool. The problem is we don't put enough criminals behind bars and keep them there. And Esposito knows this. We let them go with a slap on the wrist, even after they commit multiple offenses, mainly because of the color of their skin. And we'll get to more of that later. Those criminals are put back out on the streets to reoffend over and over and over again. If you start putting criminals away, close our borders to illegal immigrants who, many of whom are violent criminals in their home countries. And if the violent crime stats don't change, then we can talk about something else. But we're not doing those things first. So I don't want to hear any idea, any suggestion that we need to restrict the the rights of law-abiding citizens if we're not even going to do anything about criminals and illegal immigrants. Now, her opponent is a Democrat named... Pat Ryan, who was elected in 2022 in a special election, <clears throat> he is unlike um, Esposito. He has no background in law enforcement. He is a retired Army Intel officer, which means he probably never fired a weapon during his service. He is probably like Tim Walls, because unlike the Marines, where every Marine is a rifleman, in the Army you can pretty much serve your whole career and very rarely touch a gun. Um. 
And in, in as an intel officer, who needs to be proficient with a rifle when you're busy keeping tabs on our allies like Israel and passing that info onto our enemies like Iran or delivering you know, meals to starving people in Africa as we did in the 90s. We turned the, the military into basically a food delivery service. That's what got so many killed in Mogadishu. It's why Marines, and I started to say former Marines, and that would have been a faux pas because once a Marine, always a Marine. This is why Marines are not generally supportive of gun control, like former Army Intel officers, apparently, or command sergeant majors like Tim Waltz. <laughs> But I digress. Let's get back to the story. Uh, Esposito's opponent, Ryan, said during the debate that he supports a ban on assault weapons. Quote, these are weapons of war and they should not be on our street. I should really play this in a funny voice because it would make more, it would be more impactful. Uh, we absolutely should put back in place an assault weapons ban, he said. We saw this from 1994 to 2004 when we had one in this country. It dramatically brought down violent gun deaths and saved lives. We also should ban bump stocks. We also should limit high-capacity magazine rounds. End quote. So first of all, this is how you tell me you know nothing about guns without actually saying the words, I know nothing about guns. When you say things like, High capacity magazine rounds. It means that you're a dope. Um, the assault weapons ban dramatically brought down violent gun deaths, he said. Now, saying it this way is a, a little odd turn of phrase. The assault, I mean, t saying violent gun deaths implies that there are gun deaths that aren't violent, which I think most. Victims of you know, <laughs> most people who are killed by a gun or with a gun would argue that that was not a nonviolent act, whether it was suicide or accident. I assume that well, that's what he's doing here. He's trying to distinguish violent crime from, say, suicide or an accident. I will give him that. We'll be charitable. And many Christians would, would argue that we should be in agreement with, with Representative Ryan here that, that, if you're a hypocrite, if you claim to love life or if you're pro-life, but you oppose gun control, if you would oppose the assault weapons ban, for example, or a, a reinstatement of the assault weapons ban, that we should, as a Christian, be in support of those things. And my argument there would be that being a Christian doesn't mean that I abandon reason uh, simply to support some notion of being pro-life. The Bible's pretty clear on the use of force and the possession of weapons in self-defense or the use of force by government in protection of the innocent or in punishment of the wicked. Go look at Romans 13 as an example or check out my book, Duty to Defend, Defending God's Word from Those Who Would Misuse It in the Gun Rights Debate, available uh, at the Armed Lutheran store. We have signed copies available and uh, also available on Amazon. It's got lots of great articles by ordained Lutheran pastors um, refuting argument, biblical-based arguments, scripture-based arguments in support or in opposition to gun control. So check that out. But I, again, I digress. Let's look at some numbers. Let's get into some stats, some actual stats. Now, for those who would argue that this, that, that no, 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 this statistic about the decline of violent crime and violent and homicides during that the period of the ban um, that that's all bunk. Keep in mind that that that's actually true. Firearms homicides declined thirty nine percent from nineteen ninety three to two thousand eleven, and non fatal firearm crime declined sixty nine percent during that same period. Um, well, not during that same period, but from, from 93 to 2011, which is, is a few years. Uh, actually, let me go back. I read that number wrong. Firearms-related homicides declined 39% from 1993 to 2011. Just caught my own mistake. 
2011 is seven years past the end of the, the ban. So why is it that homicides continue to drop, gun death and gun crime continues to drop, even after the ban was lifted? I wonder why that would be. That right there undermines the argument that Ryan is making. But there was a decline during that period of the ban. That's impressive, right? Well, consider that about 70 to 80% of firearm homicides and 90% of non-fatal firearm victimizations are committed with a handgun, not with an assault weapon. Wait, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that undercuts the argument. So let's dig a little deeper. 54 to 65% each year of all gun deaths are suicides. So we're talking about roughly half the number. Whenever you see a number trotted out, I think the most recent is like 48,000 um, gun-related homicides or gun-related deaths. Remember that about half, anywhere from half to two-thirds are actually suicides every year. A very small percentage of those are accidents that may be 500 a year and then another 500 roughly are law enforcement. So that means that roughly 40% of the number that gets trotted out in the news every year, only about 40% of those are actual criminal homicides. And according to Pew Research, citing data from the FBI, rifles of all kinds, they don't break it down any further than that, rifles of all kinds, and that would include things that are considered quote-unquote assault rifles, account for just 3% of criminal homicide. 3%. So less, so that means less than 3% is actually quote-unquote assault rifles because that number, that 3% number, includes long guns of all kinds, except for shotguns. Shotguns is about 1%. So hunting rifles are included in that number. Sporting rifles are included in that number that are not generally considered um, uh, quote-unquote assault rifles. And they, the assault weapon and assault rifle definition is, is kind of amorphous and silly anyway. So, But be that as it may, setting that aside for a moment, gun deaths dropped significantly during the ban from 94 to 2004, that's true. It's continued to decline since 2004. That is also true. It has seen a spike recently. But <clears throat> since less than 3% of those deaths involve so-called assault weapons and not handguns or shotguns, how is it that deaths, those deaths decline so much? And assuming that the ban eliminated death by assault weapon, entirely during that period, and it didn't, because remember, Columbine happened during the Clinton assault weapons ban. But even for the sake of argument, if you assume that banning all assault weapons, so-called assault weapons, would eliminate deaths by those weapons, that only means you're cutting deaths by th less than 3%. So, that, and that's a far, that's like a far cry from the 39% de decline that can't possibly account for the 39% decline in firearms death during the period of the ban. Well, since 93. So what else happened? The 1994 Clinton crime bill toughens sentences for crime, meaning that the rate of incarceration increased at the same time that gun violence numbers were dropping. What a coincidence. Who knew that keeping criminals in prison would result in crime going down? <laughs> Mind blown. So banning so-called assault weapons, just looking at those numbers, that means that banning those weapons had absolutely no impact at all. Almost no impact on the declining rate of firearms violence. So why has firearms violence increased in recent years? 
Is it because the, the Clinton gun ban at sunset in 2004? No. Because we saw the numbers continue to decline from 2004 to 2011. And beyond. It's only in recent years that we've seen a, an increase. And what is the recent increase? And why do they cut it off at 2011? Because it was in 2012, in Obama's second term, that things changed. We started going soft on crime entirely because of race. The Clinton crime bill resulted in an increase in incarceration, which means, by extension, you end up disproportionately, disproportionately impacting the black community. Not because the criminals are black, but because blacks commit a wildly disproportionate amount of violent crime in this country relative to their overall percentage of the population. That's just a fact. That's not, um, that's not racism. I'm not blaming it on the fact that they're black. It's just a fact. People who peddle in this idea that the system is racist, this, the systemic racism idea or DEI, um, they see disparity in those numbers and they immediately assign that to racism. Blacks are disproportionately incarcerated, not because they commit more crime, but because simply because they're black and nothing else. Skin color to them explains everything. And this all started in 2012 with Obama and his criminal justice reform and his immediate you know, blaming of, um, uh, of police for violence and, and brutality, the whole Ferguson incidents, everything that stemmed from Ferguson and the shooting of Michael Brown. So criminal justice reform, whenever you see that term, it doesn't really seek to eliminate actual discrimination. It's really only to seeking to eliminate disparity. If there are 10,000 murders and 7,000 of those are committed by blacks, that's evidence of discrimination, they say. So to correct that racism, you have to let, you have to let a number of those murderers go to make sure that it, it's even. So you want to make it even, you want to get it down to 3,000. So if 3,000 of those 10,000 are committed by whites, then you got to let 4,000 of the 7,000 black criminals loose with a slap on the wrist and a promise not to do it again. This is supposedly to correct historic racism. But the problem is that those criminals that you let go with the promise not to do it again, they always do it again and again and again. A large percentage, and we've said this before on the show, a large percentage of the crime in this country is committed by a really tiny fraction of the popul overall population. And then an even smaller percentage of that fraction of the overall population is reoffending at a very high rate. 43% of criminals reoffend within a year, 77% within five. So we're seeing an increase in recent years in violent crime, not because of guns, but because of criminals, because we've, we've gone soft, especially since the pandemic, where we were letting people out of jail so that they wouldn't catch COVID. We were telling police that, you know, informing the, the public that police won't be coming to your, you know, to, to uh, follow up on your crime report unless it's really, really bad. And so we're letting lots of crime just go by the wayside without any response. And those that we do respond to, we're putting the criminals back on the streets thanks to George Soros-backed DEI, you know, race warriors in, in district attorney's offices. We saw a decrease in violent crime in the 90s, not because of the gun ban, but because we made an effort Admittedly, an imperfect effort, maybe an overzealous one in some ways, but it was an effort to reduce crime by keeping criminals behind bars, and that's irrefutable. 
but Democrats keep bringing up a gun ban every election cycle and claiming that that's the, the reason for the decline in crime rates. Why do they do that instead of actually looking at the, at, at the, the numbers like we've gone through here? It's real simple. It's a cynical answer, but it's realistic. It's easier to blame guns and gun owners than it is to blame criminals. Especially if a disproportionate number of those criminals are black and you're a Democrat. Gun owners won't be voting for you anyway, so there's no reason to court you. But the majority of blacks will. The black vote blindly votes Democrat year after year after year after year. Because they believe that Democrats actually care about them. They've been fooled into thinking that they actually care. And if you're a politician, if you're a Democrat politician, and you want to crack down on crime, well, you'll necessarily be increasing the incarceration rate of black communities and undermining that anti-police rhetoric that you've been pushing since Obama's second term. And that would hurt your ability to pander to the black community and to count on their support, blindly count on their support for your next election. It's really as simple as that. It's easier to demonize scary looking guns, guns that millions of Americans own. But if you're a Democrat, I'd say it's probably a safe bet that more than 90% of your voters do not own those firearms. So, it's easy to blame the scary guns and their high capacity magazine rounds than it is to actually address the real issue of crime. Because if you're an advocate for getting tough on crime, that naturally is going to alienate your voter base. The very demographic that you need to win your election. And we can't do that. As politicians do not care about crime. They do not care about guns. They really only care, care about one thing, and that's themselves, to be honest. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm making a, an Eighth Commandment violation here by, by trying to <laughs> impute some, some rationale for their, uh, or motive for their positions, but I think it's a, I don't think I'm going out on a very weak limb here. They really, at, at the core of it, are not willing to stand up for what's right if it means risking their jobs. They would rather, I think very, very few politicians in America are willing to stand on principle or to defend the truth if it means risking their re-election. And that's why we need term limits. One of the reasons. So that self-serving people, and we're, you know, we're a government of, for, and by the people, which means we're, of, like I said last week, although government is instituted by God for our good, <clears throat> it's also run by people who are flawed and sinful. So that's why so few will stand on principle, even if it means risking their job. And speaking of <clears throat> elections, as we kind of round things out, I do want to mention this is the kind of thing, this particular debate and its flashpoint in the New York 18th district is, this is an issue all across the country. Even in, if you're in a reliably safe red district, this is an issue everywhere. There are people like Representative Ryan who would very willingly take away your rights just to secure the votes of, of a certain demographic. So that means you need to get out and vote. Early voting, I think, starts, it may have started in some places 
If not, it's going to be starting soon. Uh, I think we're about a week away here in Texas uh, from early voting opening. So get out there and take advantage of those options. Get out there and take advantage of the options that your locality offers for early voting. Don't wait to the last minute and end up in a line or unable to get there and because of some other issue. This is an important election. They all are. I'm not going to sit here and say this is the most... I hate it when politicians or pundits get out there and say things like, this is the most important election in our lifetime. They're all the most important election in your lifetime. Get out there and vote. If you want to change the direction of the country, you need to get out and vote. Because remember, in-person voting always... I think I have this correct... In-person voting always favors Republicans. It's the mail-in ballots and the early voting that gets counted later. Those favor the Democrats. So use those opportunities to cast your vote this year. Use that advantage against them or to, to negate that advantage. I know there's some people who say, oh, that's just, you know, they don't want to, take advantage of earlier mail-in voting because they feel like that's somehow cheating. Uh, it's, a, it's an option for you to use, and it's perfectly legal, so go use it. For my Trump-hating listeners, remember this. This is what I'm going to leave you with here for this week. You're not voting for Trump, really. The name on the ballot says Trump. But in reality, you're voting no matter who you vote for, you're voting for your neighbor. You're voting for the neighbor who can't afford the increased cost of energy or groceries or gas or rent or mortgages. The neighbor whose labor value is undercut by the influx of illegal immigration. The neighbor whose daughter is forced to share a locker room with men. The neighbor whose child was killed by an illegal immigrant or who's, who was you know, family members, friends or family members died because an illegal immigrant slammed into the, drove drunk and killed them. Got plenty of those stories out there. The neighbor whose city is struggling to keep up with the services required to support this influx of illegal immigrants, think Springfield, Ohio, for all the silliness about eating cats and, and eating dogs. That city's overwhelmed with, and, and there are others like it, where their populations are, and their city government is just overwhelmed with, with illegals that just get dumped in their city. The neighbor who's affected by re recent storms, like I mentioned last week, whose disaster relief funds are being wasted housing illegal immigrants. And I know this is a <laughs> turning into a rant against illegal immigration. But the neighbor whose streets are more dangerous because we refuse to keep criminals behind bars. That's who you're voting for. The neighbor whose gun rights are threatened by a party that is tough on guns, but soft on crime. That's who you're voting for. So get out there, take advantage of the opportunities that are offered in your area, and vote. All right. Like I said, I had a couple more stories that I was going to bring you, but... As I started thinking through and making notes on this one, well, this was enough for one day. So I'll save those other two for another time. So if you've got any comments or any questions, if you have any thoughts about this issue or any other, please visit our feedback page, armlutheran.us slash feedback. Leave us a voicemail, uh, voice message, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Suggest a future topic for an episode. That would be awesome. Be sure to tune in next week for episode number 421. And if you would like to be a part of our future online hangouts, visit the uh, Reformation Gun Club and sign up today, uh, armedlutheran.us slash gun club. We would love to have you join us. Until we get together again, keep shooting, keep praying. We'll talk to you next time. For show notes, be sure to visit our website at www.armedlutheran.us. Check out the Facebook page, The Armed Lutheran, or join our Facebook group, Fans of Armed Lutheran Radio. 
If you like what you hear, please leave us a comment on our feedback page at armedlutheran.us slash feedback or a review on iTunes and let us know what you think. Thank you for listening to Armed Lutheran Radio, a member of the Self-Defense Radio Network.